community development and rural upliftment in rural areas around Mysore, especially in the HD Kote Taluk, Mysore district. Now, they cater service to a population of more than 3 lakh. In his 23 years of service, Dr. Balasubramaniam has won a lot of awards and he is a role model for the modern youth in India. Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement was awarded the National Youth Award by the Government of India in the year 1991-92. Now we entreat our Chief Guest Dr. Balasubramaniam to please deliver his speech on nation building We the youth. Revered Swami Gautamanji, Swami Atma Shraddhanji, Professor Karmalkar, <coughs> friends and in the, in the audience. <coughs> Today's topic is a very fascinating one. It consists of two things. One is nation building, one is be the youth. And putting it two together, in my opinion, is dynamite. Because we can do quite a bit of it together. I start with a very simple question because many of us are very young here. Very simple question. IIT is considered to be the cream of India and the best of India come here. So very simple question is, can any of you here tell me what percentage of us in this country are considered young? This is we the youth in nation building. Many of us, sadly, across the country ask this question every talk I begin. Within India and outside India, we are actually 72% of us less than 40 years today. We are the youngest nation in the world, demographically. The challenge is 52% of us are less than 25. Half this country is less than 25. Any guess who is the youth minister of India? I wish IIT, JEA also had these questions. <laughs> then all of us would have known the answers. We are all driven by a sense of personal achievement that somewhere along the way, national involvement becomes a casualty. And that's my concern, and that's what I'm going to speak about today. Till recently, we had an 82 year old man as a youth minister of India. Where hardly any of us know, we hardly bother also. A man who's 82 years leading this country, thankfully, God wanted his services, he departed leaving us this little younger minister. The average age of the union cabinet today is 68. But 52% of us are less than 25. Isn't it strange that we, so-called 72% of us less than 40, 40 is now te technically considered to the age for youth, up to 40. We are living in a country where nearly three-fourths of this country demographically is less than 40, but led by presidents and prime ministers who need the cane to help them to walk. That's India for you. And before I begin, most of us, all of us, know India. Recently we had a campaign, Shine, India Shining. India is shining. The greatness of India is we are all caught up in this wonderful age where things are progressing at such astonishing pace. Uh, I'm sure as young scientists, most of you can relate. Recently the United Nations, I think some 10 years ago, early 2000 or 2001, they had a conference in Geneva trying to look at understanding what science and technology did to development of this country and during, to the world itself. And during their analysis they found out, they tried to find out the middle point of development from, from crisis era to 2000. And uh, they realized that 1900 was the middle point. What happened in 1900 years, in a materialistic sense, let's, let's stick to materialism now, took 100 years to happen, the next 100 years. And they went a step ahead and they found out what the last century was the midpoint. We could, we could play some middle point for century. They said 1996. In the 100 years, 1901 to 2000, 1996 was the midpoint in development. And if you were to ask somebody between 2000 and 2007 if you could plot a midpoint, maybe they'll say yesterday. That is the rate of change in which we are all living today. And that's the rate of change in which India is living also. Now we are all talking about 2020. It's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to feel part of a country which is going at 9% growth. It's, it's fascinating when the, when the Union uh, Finance Minister comes to Parliament and talks of India's growth rate being 8.5% to 9%. It's wonderful news. All of us are part of a system which is growing so rapidly. Growth, unfortunately, gets measured only in economic terms. 
economy is only wealth for this country, the capacity that we produce wealth. Everything else is not really measured. Human development indices are not really spoken about in parliament. But we live in a country which is going at 9%, sustained late 9% in the last one year. What has it done to this country? I, my friends, come from a part of India which is very close to a city which is possibly growing at 9% or faster, Mysore. But I come from the forest of HD Kote, which is, we have two national parks, the Bandipur and Nagarwala National Park. I come from an area where people find the second meal a luxury. So there is a distinct Bharat, there is a distinct India. And I would like to share with you the difference. India is growing, it's rapidly growing, growing at a rate of, I know how many of you are aware that the top 20% of Indians control 85% of India's wealth. But my concern is about the bottom 20%. The bottom 20% amongst whom I live controls 1.5% of India's wealth. The so-called great Indian middle class unfortunately controls only 13.5% of India's wealth. It isn't so great either, but anyway. But that is the India that we are all living in. Now, when you talk of economy, the government talks of figures. I am part of the planning commission in my own small way. It's very, very unfortunate when we, you know, people are proud to narrate this figure. You know, it sort of pains me even to talk about it. 21% of Indians last year contributed to 27% of India's GDP. It's wonderful news, it's great news. Most of you want to be computer scientists because that's where the economy gets generated today. The soft services, the finance sector, the, all the sector which you can talk of contributed 27%. I have no complaints against them. Somebody who believes in Vivekananda understands that development has happened by evolution. It can never happen by revolution. And this 27%, I have no complaints. But my concern is about the remaining 62% of Indians who contributed to 17% of India's economy. And that is very tragic because they all, 80% of them live in villages. And we are talking of a situation of 2020 where India will be a you know, global leader. Will we really be a global leader? We can and we will and we should, provided this so-called great Indian youth of 74%, 72% actually starts participating in nation building. What is this nation building all about? Nation building is not taking on a small bag, walking out like me to the forest and sitting there and talking about development. No, nation building is in every aspect of life that we live in, everything that we do today. It's so important because we are a threshold of such potential growth. All that you need is value-based leadership to take us there. Now, I remember a small story, I keep telling my children, we run a few schools in the forest. Now, this story has always appealed to me and every time I narrate it, I feel very thrilled by it. It's a very simple story, maybe many of you have heard this before. A small child comes home crying, a three, four year old girl, only child, obviously only child means in Tamil they say, a little Tamil, I'll try to use it also. And small, it comes home crying and this uh, father comes home from the office, he sees his daughter crying, he's very agitated. Maybe a computer engineer comes home tired at 8.39, work, slogged his way, about 12 hours a day in the office, comes home wanting a cup of coffee. And as usual in a society like ours, the wife is supposed to come and give him the coffee. So he's very tired wanting his coffee, but this child is crying and disturbing him, pulling his pants. He's very upset. So he's very irritated. And then this, he asks the child, why, why are you crying? And the child says, listen, I didn't do anything. I went to school. My teacher beat me up. He's very agitated. He says, what is this? I myself don't even beat you. Who is this teacher to beat you there? And what did you do to get beaten? After that, Nyanodaya comes in. He says, what did you do to get beaten? And he says, I, I didn't do anything. Appa. All I did was... I stole my neighboring girl's pencil. For that, the teacher beat me up. The fellow gets so agitated. What nonsense is this? Why did you have to do that? Why did you have to steal your neighbor's pencil? If you just told me in the morning, I would have brought your box of pencils from my office. <laughs> this is the kind of leadership we have. We have leadership today in this country, which has absolutely no second thoughts of looting this nation. Looting it completely dry to the extent that even the, the, the fodder that you give to cattle, they finished off. They have not left anything out in this country. No, it, it's a very sad state that in 1991, the floor of parliament, the Prime Minister of India tells, and none of us even questioned it, that this country for one rupee to reach the masses, transactional cost is 85%. How could you ever accept that in a nation, if, if a private, most of you are going to go into the private sector, fortunately or unfortunately, and if your company were to have a transactional cost of 85% to deliver a product, you will be closing down in three days. I am sure none of you will even want to see a financial aid ending with that kind of a figure. But this great nation of us, the transaction cost of delivering any service is 85 percent. And that transaction is not just salaries for our staff. It is also what unfortunately is corruption. And corruption is a product of what we see today is because of the values possibly my father's generation or the generation earlier than that. 
as well endowed us with absolutely no values. We belong to, you know, in a, to a generation of people who are hardly concerned. I have a small role in the Lokayukta of Karnataka where our job is to catch these fellows. I, it's now seven months since I've taken on that role. I'm, I was a very great optimist. I always thought India has got a great future until I went there. I've been, I'm, 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 I've resigned a couple of days ago. Hopefully my resignation will be accepted because I've become so, I was getting to be very cynical. I suddenly started feeling India has got no future with this kind of people. I have seen corruption at its such worst and blatted form and people getting away so easily in this nation of ours. But for my strong belief in Gandhi and Gandhiism and Ahimsa, I would have possibly become an accelerate too. That is the level and that's because of a great national apathy of all of us. We have abdicated what we are supposed to be doing in whatever sense in the world. Now, every way you look, if Tendulkar scores a century at 16, we clap our hands. If Sanya Mirza becomes number 28 at 18, we clap our hands. If Bill Gates makes his million at 19, we say great. But how many of us look at nation building at 18, at 19, at 20, when we really have the energy and the will to do it? We simply don't bother. Everything is getting anger and anger in achievement today, except in national leadership, except in politics, if you can call it that. Somewhere, we have completely abdicated our role in even worrying about this nation of ours. And unless that happens, nothing called nation building can happen. You know, you know there is so much to do. What is this great Bharat that I would like to talk to you about? If 100 children in a country go to school in rural India, six complete their SLC. I would like to challenge each one of you here. How many children from our villages get into an IIT? Is it that Indians in villages are idiots? Is it that they are incapable? Is it that they just can't even aspire to be here? How many, you know, in, in Karnataka last year, I did an analysis of the common entrance test. Out of the first thousand ranks in medicine, one was from a village. Out of the first thousand ranks in engineering, six were from villages. Why this great inequity of this country of ours? In Karnataka, 54% of electricity produced in Karnataka goes to power Bangalore city alone. It is not just Karnataka, across India, there is such a great urban-rural divide that unless we address this issue, unless we use our knowledge and technology today to address this rural urban inequities, Naxalism is going to be a real problem which is, which is growing. One third of India today is Naxalite infested. Why? It's possibly a product of a social inequity that exists. Why are we not able to look at 40% of our Indians today don't have more than 1000 kilocalories of food? These are not just plain statistics, these are real truth if you lived in a village. Not more than, and we have the best of technology, we have the technology which can, every three months we test a missile. Every missile test costs this nation 650 crores. I am not against that, I am not against defense build-up. Last January we launched a satellite from, uh, which ISRO did, uh, la launched a rocket, which possibly launched two satellites together, two or three satellites together. We are only one among the three countries in this world which has the capability to do that, after Russia and the USA. We have the greatest of technological minds in this country to deliver satellites and missiles, but we don't have a scientist to build a toilet at 2,000 rupees in the villages. 8% of India has access to a toilet today. Are we a nation of such important scientists that we can't find solutions for rural India? 21% of Indians today have access to safe drinking water. I was just walking around the campus today and saw the lush, green, beautiful place. I looked at the amount of taps you have, the number of toilets you have. Just wondering, just imagine. You close on all the drinking water in IIT for one day. You close on all your toilets for two days. And say you'll have to live and exist. How would you do it? That is India. The first time I went into a tribal area called Brahmagiri, exactly 20 years ago, today is, today is 25th, three days from now, 28th of 1987, is when I went into this tribal area. Uh, I was born and brought up in Bangalore, absolutely no inkling of a village at all. And I go there, there wasn't a toilet. And that was the first shock to me. I didn't know what to do the next morning. Now, it was a great uh, feeling of helplessness and wonder and what do we do? It never occurred to me that millions of Indians that have this, never had this question in their minds every morning. But I had that question in rural India. So after a great deal of, I took a great deal of courage, went to the tribal next door. I was living in this, one of his hut that he had built there. So I was sharing it. I went and asked him. No, they were quite happy in the morning. So they never had a problem. But I was getting uneasy. You know, the, the stomach takes its toll. After two hours, I was one. I was wanting to forget social service. I don't want anything. I let me go back to the city now. But then little courage came to me. I went and asked him, "What do you do?" He laughed at me. He said, "Ye en sare diko dot samasya nae do card gogi on saaguni ele to bolle." What it means in in English is that this is not a big issue. I'll walk into the forest. Lot of teak leaves have fallen down. Use it. And in a refined way, we use it as tissue. But our tribal use it as a leaf. 
This is the reality of rural India and it's not, you know, maybe in a way tribal is better because at least it's got a tea cliff, but in most villages you don't even have that today, you don't even see many trees today. But what do we do? Can we find solutions? Can you and I work together to find bridges which can actually bridge these inequities today? Look at, look at social inequities, look at political inequities, look at any sector of human development and endeavor you take, there are such inequities and there are solutions for everything. And in my opinion, the first solution comes by participation. By we not running, shirking away from what we are supposed to be doing, we not, you know, the obsession with our own selves has come to a point where we don't even look at our neighbors at all. A little, if we really, if we really spend time understanding Vivekananda, if we really want to study what he has been talking to us, if we really, study of Vivekananda cannot happen without practicing what Vivekananda said. You have to live the values that Swamiji said to make a difference in this country. Otherwise, it's nothing you can do. You can read Vivekananda for hundreds of years, but if you don't begin to live what he said, I don't think India can ever, ever be the great nation that we're dreaming of in 2020. And that begins with each one of us. Let's not worry about this nation. Let's not worry about the great problems that we're facing. Let's begin with each one of us. How many of us have the courage to be the change that we want to see? Wherever I go, people complain. They complain the streets are not okay, the, grid, the drain is not okay, people are corrupt, the politicians are useless, we have no leadership, we have no problem. All that we say, how many of us have the courage to get up and say, I will be the change I want to see. If I want to eliminate corruption, I will be incorruptible, I will not corrupt people. If I want to talk about India, let me be the one who will go do it there. Let me be the one who will go into the streets and work for this great country of ours. Can we be that? If we have that kind of courage, reading Vivekananda has made a difference in your lives. Because Vivekananda gives you conviction. He says, make one ideal, Professor said it beautifully, and that one ideal alone, live for it. If you have that kind of a courage, yes, we can make a difference. And India needs us, especially what I call Bharata, the rural India. Enormous work is necessary. Like I told you, we are spending 75,000 crore rupees to ensure every child is in school today. All borrowed money. And what is it? If transactional cost of the 75,000 crores is going to be 85%, we are going to spend 5,000 crores for taking every child to school. It's a national disaster. Why can't we get involved in management of that funds? Why can't well, you and I, as citizens of this country, be concerned? Why can't we even wonder what we can do about it? We don't even bother. We don't even look at national mainstream. Our media, media which has to be one which could possibly guide us, we don't even question it. I am actually fascinated. The last two days, you switch on any TV. Morning, I was in the guest house watching one channel after another, all the news channels. I have this habit of not going without the news. Every newspaper you open, every news channel you read is more obsessed with Sanjay Dutt's arrest and more obsessed with Salman Khan's arrest than this great country of ours. We are obsessed with the Sania Mirza's hem skirt line and how long it should be than worry about drinking water and uh, sanitation problems of the country. Why? Are we leading the media or is the media leading us? Every sector of human development you take. I am not sure how many of you followed this. 20 years ago, a 13-year-old boy in Orissa was convicted for murder. I am not even sure any of you even have read this in the papers. Four days ago, there was a judgment of the State Human Rights Commission awarding him 8 lakhs. For a murder which he never committed, this great country, judiciary of us, sent him to jail. He realized it after two years that he was not all the fellow involved in it. Ordered his release. Somebody somewhere forgot to tell the boy and the jailer to release him. He was, he was in the jail for a 13-year-old child, remember. 1994, somebody woke up to the fact there's a clerical error and this child should have been released long ago. Decides to release him and they release him some six or seven years ago, 2000, by the time they actually decide to release him. He spent 14 years in jail for a crime he never committed, the best part of his childhood and we don't even notice it in our papers or on the TV. But a Salman Khan who's killed hundreds of animals, deserves the punishment he has to get. But we talk about it, debate about it, every channel you open, all of people are worrying and all sympathizing with him. Because 100 crore is riding on his shoulders. There is not a rupee riding on the 13 old boy's life. Somewhere we have got a national priority is wrong. And you have to write it, let's stop complaining. Let's stop participating. Let you and I become part of the solution. For that, what Gandhiji said is what has to happen. We need to be the change we have to see. If each one of us decide that somewhere we will actually get involved in this nation's growth in this nation's building, then this rural divide, these inequities can actually be solved. Every child in school can actually become a citizen who is contributing to this great economy of ours, who can benefit by this growth, and this who is benefiting. I am not again, I again will go back to what Swamiji said, the most, the greatest development concept Swamiji said was you can take India up 
by pulling people from the bottom top not pulling down people from the top to bottom he said by evolution and not by revolution can you change india we have examples russia failed china will fail at some point or they already changed we can't afford to go the truth the only route we have is what gandhi and vivekananda have to shown us ahimsa seva satya tyaga is a, it's something which you need to follow and we can it's challenging a lot of people tell me to be harness is very difficult i actually find it very simple one you don't need a good memory at all but telling the truth all the time you don't have to worry about what you told somebody else and you can just live life like an open book you know that the your detractors become i have been threatened to be killed i have been beaten up i have been arrested uh, the introducer to me said i have been given awards lot of awards came i have gone to jail also many times this great country of us will give you ambedkar award one day put you in jail the next day also but that's 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 what you have that's what happens to you but you can get away with all it because like swami ji said a great strength comes a great power comes somewhere all those things come provided you're fearless and that begins when we be the change we want to see when we actually start practicing what we preach when actually we can start preaching what we practice to now a lot of lot of time in the world i always believed as a young child when i grew up when my parents brought me up and society brought me whatever seeing is believing they always told me you always you know you only have to believe what you see but young friends experience today has taught me it's not true believing is seeing we always get to see what we believe in you believe india is great india has got a great future you'll always see it you believe india has got all the problems which every other world has got but we don't see it that's all you always see only that and we need to make a difference i end my talk here with a small story let's not identify the wrong problem most of us think i i, I wouldn't even say don't leave india i wouldn't say don't go abroad i don't really i don't think geographical barriers mean anything when you actually start loving this country everything disappears you know only thing is we need to know what problem to address i have a small story where you know the normal at home you have a hiccup your mother says drink a glass of water that's a standard thing most of us have used to it vikkar the tani kudi that's the answer they give so similarly in the west i keep telling in canada il neer kudi ali beer kudi anta that's only difference so eng uh, on eng man comes rushing into a bar very agitated meets the bartender and asks him do you have anything here for hiccups the bartender is very uh, he looks around search around he sees a lot of bottles he wonders what to give him looks down finds a very wet old rag which had used to wipe the floor takes it and gives him one mop that fellow shocked he's hurt he said what did you, what did you do to me why did you beat me up he says look your hiccups have stopped this fellow then looks at the bar and says but then i never had the hiccups my wife sitting in the car outside had it all the time <laughs> let us not look at india's problems like this let's not jump to solutions they are huge a 30 minute talk cannot give you all the solutions but each one of us start looking at it addressing it i think we have the intellectual capital in this country we are the best of brains we are the people who can slog it out and most greatest asset is our population it's not a problem if 72% of us are less than 40 what greater strength that we need if 52% of us are less than 25 what greater strength that you need to have we have all that but do we have the will you need to understand that thank you i i'm sorry i still have 5 minutes i i deliberately cut it short by 5 minutes because if there any questions or anything that you would like to ask i'd be more than happy to answer you Have you done that? Have you told people that? That that's the concern I have. Most of us at the young age, all of us live by second-hand experience. We always manage. That, that's exactly what Vivekananda never said. Vivekananda said, "Test me, experience what I say. Go do it." I also believe like you. Go into a village. Which villager has said, "I don't want to use a toilet"? Which villager has said, "I don't want electricity"? Which villager says, "I don't want a good school"? I don't want a good hospital. Yes, behavioral change is very, very critical. behavioral change is a very difficult task if tomorrow morning i tell you let me tell you scientifically i can prove to you that brushing your teeth in the morning is plain rubbish brushing your teeth at night is the most important thing to do so from tomorrow every morning stop brushing your teeth because scientifically all bacteria accumulates in organic material left behind the whole day of chewing and that has to be removed at night in the night 
and you go to bed with hardly any organic material, there is no bacteria accumulating in your teeth. So, brushing at teeth is only makes sense. Brushing in the morning is to satisfy Colgate company, that's all, or two times a day. But will you stop brushing from tomorrow morning? Honestly tell me, you can't, you will not. Behavioral change is so difficult. It's, it's inborn in us for centuries. For centuries the people have lived like that. So, it takes time and that is why I have to be there for 20 years. When I went in, child mortality was 130 per every thousand. Today it is 32. But you, I, had, I needed to be there for 30 years running a hospital, 20 years running a hospital. 8% was the sanitation coverage in Hishtikote Taluk 5 years ago. Today it is 52%. People are willing to change. They have to be told how. And that is exactly what you and I have to do. You and I are privileged because we are here and we have been given that extra knowledge. Have to take on the responsibility going and bringing about the behavioral change. Let's start with that. Go into in your, all your lifetime, if you can take, change 10 houses in a village and get them to have a toilet, I think your life is done. So let's go out there and do it. Most of us, before we take the first step, worry about the fall that we'll have after the 100 step. But have you walked the 100 steps to fall at all? So be the change you want to see. So what? After turning 13 posts in this field, the guy still wants to drill a 14th post, even with a 5% chance of getting a word. But still, he wants to go for a word rather than trying to look at some alternative solution, which a lot of people are still advocating. But to drive this point, you know, in the process of driving the point, you lose, you have to live their lives as your day. You, see, you really have to live in themselves rather than living like what you would like to be. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a sacrifice to the experience in the body. But uh, if somebody is ready for it, nothing comes easy in life. No? How much have you sacrificed to be in IIT? Don't you see it as a sacrifice? I think you sacrificed two years of your best childhood, studying all the time to get into IIT JE. In my way of looking at it, different perspectives. But that's exactly what India needs. Go there, live in the village, understand the farmer's problem. Why does he want the 14 bore well? There must be something driving him. If he wants 14 bore wells, 14th time he wants to drill, there's something driving him deeply. You understand that, we find the solution. Like I said, the bartender story, I always remember it. We always have a solution. How do you know your solution is good for him? He, he's not a fellow, you know, your, that's your hiccup, not his yet. So go live his life, understand his hiccup, then you'll find the right answer for him. That's what experience has taught me. I went there like you. I went there thinking medical care is the best thing they need. Because that's the only thing I was trained in. I was trained to be a doctor. And I was wondering why aren't people delivering in my hospital? The delivery in the hospital was 2%. I said, what the hell, I am trained to be a doctor. So the need was in me to deliver children rather than the people to come and get it delivered by me. Live with them. I can narrate a very, something which changed my life a lot. Possibly it could affect your life. I had just been there, young doctor, 87, uh, nine, not just 21, 22, lot of enthusiasm, just read Swami Vivekananda's work, thought the world needs me. Uh, I thought society needs me. I am a young doctor going to a village, nobody has done that before, in a forest. And after two, three months after going there, a woman got was to deliver. I can't even call her a woman, child, 14 year old child. In our tribal, we don't have structured marriages. They start having sex at 13, 14, have children. So, young child will be delivered. I still remember because I have delivered that child now. So, I am a grandfather, is what the people joke with me. That particular child I went to deliver to the colony, and I go there. Previous evening, she was in labor pain. She was a primary graduate, first, first, first delivery, first labor case. For me, as well as for her, the first child that she was having, and she was not delivering. Normally, it takes 24 to 30 hours for her to actually deliver. Very disappointed, I came back. It's a very distant colony called Sani Madanahadi in the forest. So, I had to, 6 o'clock, we have elephants, leopard, all of that, so I had to cross all that and go. Very disappointed that I, I couldn't deliver the child. I wasn't worried about the tribal girl. No? I was more worried about I had to deliver a child. No? I had to prove a point. I'm a doctor, but I had to prove a point. I have to be relevant there. No? So, I have gone there. I have gone in search of them. With great, uh, I took again, said, somehow I have to prove my relevance. So, I said, no, no, I have to go because once delivered, I have to put gentian violet to the umbilical cord. Only a doctor can do because people don't know about gentian violet. Only I know. My tribal had a beautiful concept. They cut a fresh bamboo and use it to slice out the umbilical cord. It's got no bacteria. I have even tested it. In our lab, there's no bacteria on the fresh bamboo. And we say aseptic precaution. What greater aseptic precautions you need than that? But you know, I have to go there, tie the thread, put gentian violet. So I went there. What happened the next few minutes has changed my life completely. Small hut, I can still remember the picture. And I was this 14 year old child. I was asking her to come out and show me the baby so I could put the tension while I should kept it.